All right, I'm reading the final chapter, chapter 10. Uh, the Door in the Wall, Marguerite de Angeli. I have to say, you're going to have to excuse me because I just finished eating popcorn and some cool little thin cookies from Trader Joe's. <laughs> so, if you see anything along the camera, that is why. Um, this is a good book, by the way. I hope you all are enjoying it as much as I'm enjoying reading it, because I am. All right, chapter 10, mm, The Door in the Wall. And I also love how often the theme, clearly the, the title of the book is on point, because The Door in the Wall was very significant in the entire storyline. I love it. Okay, without further ado, let's get started. They did not linger in the house, but with a few words to the shoemaker, left by way of the garden. There was a door in the wall leading into the graveyard of the church, where John and Robin slipped quietly from one great, great tombstone to another. They entered the church by the sanctuary door, startling the sacristan, who slept and ate in a small room off the entrance porch. Who art thou, he called, hearing the creak of the door. Art friend or foe? Hiss, hiss, warned John, stepping quickly toward the light of the lantern held by the sacristan. We are friends. I am John Go in the Wind, minstrel. This lad is young Master Robin, friend and ward of Sir Peter. He hath this day saved us all. The sacristan held the lantern up where he could see John's face. Now I mind thee, he said, nodding his head. I knew thy father. John told the sacristan how Robin had, came, had come to warn him and to get help and described the plan he had made with Sir Hugh to sound the bells giving the signal for attack. Come with me then said the sacristan, leading the way. They went down the long, dark aisle of the church to the door of the tower. Give me thy crutches here, young master, said John. Canst thou climb the ladder or wilt thou go backpack, go pick a back? Tis a great height, but there are resting places. I can do it said Robin shortly. Had he not climbed to the towers and turrets of the castle many, had he not climbed to the towers and turrets of the castle many times? They had just reached the belfry when it was time for curfew to ring. The bells, one second please. The bells began an ear-splitting clamor down flat and cover thy ears quick, shouted John. They flattened themselves on the platform and endured the deafening sound. We shall go to the top first, said John, for it is yet too soon to give the signal and from there we shall see somewhat. From the belfry to the top of the tower, it was another 30 feet of climbing. When they reached the top, Robin fell in a heap onto the platform with every bit of strength gone from his legs and arms. It slowly returned. In a little while, <clears throat> in a little while he was able to rise and stand beside John, looking out over the town. We agreed that I should wait an hour after curfew when the moon will be nearly overhead, said John. That allows time for all companies to be in place and with the sounding of the bell to move in about the town and the castle wall at once. How can you tell when it's been an hour? asked Robin. By the feel of it, said John. Besides, I shall play love a garland is and lament of a lass. That will be half of an hour. He unslung the harp from Robin's back and began the music. While they waited for the rest of the hour to pass, John pointed out the familiar turrets of the castle, the North Tower where they had stood that day, and the tower off and the tower of the keep 
where the household waited for deliverance. He strummed on the harp between times. They tried to see into the hills about the town, but saw only the quiet countryside bathed in moonlight. In the town, <clears throat> in the town, supper fires sent up blue smoke, and here and there was the red glare of torchlight and campfire. Glints of moonlight on helmet or shield shone from the walls where sentries walked, but very little sound could be heard at that night, at that height. The hour was up. Now, said John, it is time for the alarm. Stay thou here, and I shall return. Cover thy ears well, but watch to see what happens. He was gone through the hatch, into the darkness below. Robin, wa Robin waited, his skin prickling with excitement. Would the signal be at the right time? Would the arrows find their mark and lift the siege? Boing! 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 The great bell rang, sending waves of sound that went out over the hills and came echoing back into the stone of the bell tower, which trembled with the vibration. At first, Robin could see nothing different from what he had seen before. Then it was as if a part of the landscape itself moved off there toward the south, just below the edge of town. Gathering from the slopes were tiny moving figures, now in the open, now lost in shadow. Robin searched for another sign, this time in the direction of Lethem Bridge. The sign was there where he could see more clearly. John came up breathing hard. What's to be seen, he asked. Are they moving? Has seen any arrows flying? He looked to the Lethem, the Lethem Bridge. Then it came, a hail of arrows that were like dark rain sped from oncoming yeomen, dropping the sentries on the bridge and picking off men of the guard manning the wall of the town. From where they stood, Robin could see it all as plainly as it had been a toy village set in a toy landscape and the soldiers, toy soldiers. He saw pikemen strike down, strike down sentries of the enemy at the, at the town gate and take prisoner of the Welsh guards. He saw the company of Sir Hugh's men enter the take, enter and take the town. It had been a complete surprise when John Go with the Wind saw what was happening and realized that the plan had been successful. He tossed his hat into the air and clasped Robin into his arms. We've won, he shouted. The Welsh are routed. I, Lindsay, has saved once more. Then, setting Robin on his feet again, he said, Stay thou here and watch how the Welsh are marched out of town whilst I go below. Thou hear such a peal of bells as shall as shall not wake as shall nigh wake the dead lying below. Down he went again. <coughs> Excuse me. Through the hatch to the belfry. With the pealing of the bells, flares went up from castle and town. Windows and doors opened. The peal of bells stopped. John came back and together they watched the lifting of the siege. They could see people running about through the streets, embracing one another, tossing caps and hats into the air, and in other ways showing their joy at being freed of the Welsh invaders. In a short while they saw the enemy marched out of town. Tears streamed down Robin's cheeks. I must not cry, he thought, wiping them away, not even for joy. Now, said John, lifting Robin aloft, thou be carried on my shoulder, so, for thou the hero of this victory. And together they went down the long stretches of ladder and stair to the ground. Check that out. How cool. 
Make haste, said Robin. Let us go to the keep at once, so Sir Peter and Lady Constance shall know that I am safe and well. Brother Luke will be sure of it, for his prayers have followed me this day. That I know. All the way through the town square, John made his way with Robin on his shoulder, high above the villagers, dancing in the dawn of returning day. They were greeted with cheers at the castle gate and followed across the courtyard to the inter inner gate to the keep by the cheering crowd. Alan at gate saw them from the gatehouse. The drawbridge was lowered and the portcullis raised. Portcullis. Maybe that's like a portico share. Okay, I think it is. And just inside, the whole company of the household stood to receive them. Sir Peter was in the center with his sons and the two pages. Near him was Lady Constance with her women and little Allison. Diath whimpered joyfully beside Brother Luke. That was, a, that was two sentences. <laughs> okay. Diath whimpered joyfully beside Brother Luke. Sir Peter held out his arms and helped Robin to the ground, placing the crutches to support him. Then placing his hand upon Robin's head, he spoke solemnly. Now before God and this company, he said, I do hail thee, conqueror and true son of thy noble father. Lady Constance, Constance. <laughs> Lady Constance embraced Robin and the women made him, made much of him. Diath too well bred a dog to push himself forward, but he eager prancing and wiggling finally wrought, finally brought him to Robin's side where he thrust his long cold nose into Robin's hand. John Go With the Wind was called forward. He was given a holding of land for his own and a portion of sheep. With it went certain rights for hunting and fishing to be his and his heirs forever. Brother Luke gave Robin his blessing and went with him to his chamber. It seems long since I left here, said Robin looking around as if he expected things to be changed. But there was the cross over his bed, and there on the workbench, the little harp, just as he had left it, waiting for the strings to be fastened to the keys. Much hath happened in this one day, said Brother Luke. I should like to hear how thy journey went. By what, by the, wait, by why look, Thou hast fared well, except for needing a good wash and a sleep. Off with thy borrowed clothes, and once more I shall care for thee. Sleep overtook Robin, even before Brother Luke had finished. The days grew short and very cold. Everyone went about with the red nose and a cloud of frozen breath. Robin was glad of the woolen gloves made for him by Lady Constance. They were snug and warm and decorated with needlework on the back. The river ran more slowly now and ice began to form along the edges. Robin stopped swimming and took his exercise in other ways. He spent a great deal of time with Adam Bauer shooting at a mark and was already at work again in the carpentry shop making a vial such as Piers Nightingale used. The harp was finished. Robin had learned how to tune it by tightening the strings and could play it a little. Brother Luke was teaching him to sing a carol because it was near to the feast of Christmas. There would be singing and caroling in the hall and Robin remembered his father's letter and hoped that Christmas was, would bring his father and mother to the castle. One day before the feast of Thomas the Apostle and after the feast of St. Lucy, the 13th of December, Robin was with Sir Peter in the armory. The coats of mail, the helmets, the lances, pikes, bows and arrows were being put in order and the great two-handed sword 
hung on the wall. See you here, said Robin, said Sir Peter. This is where the blow struck my helmet. There is a dent as large as a basin. He rubbed his head where the helmet had been thrust in. Robin ran his fingers around the ugly cavity, imagining how it would feel to be struck with a mace. He was thinking of his father and wondering whether he too had been wounded. Well, the Scottish wars have ended, thank you, he asked. I have had no word directly, answered Sir Peter. There have been rumors about, the tr about that troops of returning soldiers have been seen. Some were going southward along the high road. John Go in the Wind might tell us if he were here, but he has not been nigh the castle for weeks. I dare say he is busy building shelter for his new flocks and gathering wood for the winter that his old mother may, have, may be warm. Robin said no more, but after that, he went often to the top of the keep to scan the countryside for signs of horsemen. Sometimes he could see nothing for fog or rain. Sometimes the air was crisp and clear and he could see far beyond the hills. Once a cloud of dust on the road moving toward the town kept him excited for an hour, but it proved to be only a flock of sheep being driven to market. Once a company of lancers appeared, but they turned southward. On the afternoon of the eve of Christmas, Robin was at his post on top of the keep with Adam Bower, who was on watch. It began to snow. Robin watched while the silent whiteness covered the hills and the roofs of the town. Far, far below, he could see a hawking party. He could see the pages coming from the forest, dragging the yule log and branches of holly to decorate the hall. Suddenly, Adam Bower cried, Look! Look yonder! He pointed east, where the road led into the high road and to the town gate. Robin left the north side of the tower and joined Adam, looking toward where he pointed. The snow dimmed what he saw, but it was clear enough. A company of knights and men at arms rode toward the castle. At the head rode the king, the only, for only he wore the royal colors and the royal quarterings of the banners. At his side rode one who set his horse as only Robin's father did. In the midst of the great company were ladies, pikemen, men of armor, and yeomen. That must be the queen. Was it the Lady Maud there beside her in the center? It must be. Robin burst into a cheer. It is true! He shouted, it is true. The Scottish wars are over and my father is alive. He must have not, he must say nothing about his mother. He must say, he must say nothing about his mother for fear Adam would think him habbyish or babyish. What was I saying? Ba habbyish, babyish. <laughs> he dashed down the winding stair as fast as he dared, crossed the inner ward of the hall, thump, slip, thump, slip, and then to the solar to find Sir Peter. Thump, slip, thump, slip, thump, slip, thump, slip. Sir Peter roared with, roared with laughter at Robin's attempt to tell him about the approaching company, for he knew from the moment he had seen Robin's shining face the good news. Shall I go to the gate to be there when they enter, thank you? Asked Robin anxiously. Do what seems best, my boy, said Sir Peter. Go stand beside, mm -mm. go stand beside Alan at gate, or stay you here by my side. I know what a fever of excitement it is, thy bones, it is in thy bones, but do what you must want, you most want to do. Robin felt as if he must run to meet the company, 
must see his father and feel the comfort of his mother's arms about him. Yet he felt timid about facing either of them. They would find him so changed. If I stand beside you, my Lord, they will surely know it is I. If they see me in the courtyard, they may think I am but one of the stable boys. I shall stay here. Come, lad, said Sir Peter. Let us go to the window of the tower. There we can see the company cross the drawbridge. And before they have dismounted, we can be back ready to welcome them in the hall at the head of the stair. Before leaving the hall, Sir Peter called Dennis the page and sent word to Lady Constance to be ready to greet the noble visitors. He and Robin went quickly to the winding stair to the turret overlooking the drawbridge. They reached in in time to hear the pounding of the hoofs on the timbers of the bridge and to see the waving banners. The handsome erect figure of Sir John de Buford was fitting company for the noble looking king. And there, there now, just passing into the courtyard was, was Robin's lovely mother, the veil of her cough floating and mingling with that of the queen whom she attended. There was no time for greeting or waving. The tumult, the tumult of horse and weapon made too much noise for voices to have been heard. Sir Peter grasped Robin and swung him across his back. They went swiftly back the way they had come and were standing in welcome at the head of the great staircase as the company entered. Who spoke first or what was first said would be hard to tell. Robin found himself bowing to kiss his mother's hand, then felt her soft arms around him. Robin, my Robin, she whispered, and for a moment said no more, but only held him close as if she could not let him go. The crutches fell to the floor, the stone floor, with a great clatter. Robin's father bent to pick them up, laughing to keep from showing how deeply he was moved by the sight of them. He is my son too, he said, gently tugging at the mother's close and enfolding arms and holding Robin at his arm's length to look into his face. You are grown, he said. Your eyes no longer outrace your chin as do a child's. You've now the look of a youth. Sir John embraced his son warmly. Nothing was said of crutches or of misshapen legs or of ill fortune or of good. Sir Peter spoke. Shall we not allow our guests to retire? Yes, agreed the king. Later we shall hear news of the war's ending and how all have fared this long year. Let us go our several ways and meet again in the hall, for we are spent with weariness and soiled with travel. With another touch of his mother's hand, Robin left the company and went to find Brother Luke and to make himself ready for the audience. There never was such merrymaking as took place in the hall that Christmas Eve. Such ballads sung, such tales told. Branches of holly and spruce decked the hall and filled the air with fragrance. The yule log burned on the hearth and flaming torches filled the sconces. The king and queen sat enthralled in the great trick, the great chairs on the dais. The, a tapestry was draped on the screen behind them and rich eastern carpets beneath. Sir Peter and Lady Constance sat at one side of the king and queen and Sir John and Lady Maud at the other. Robin entered the hall with Brother Luke as he had been commanded and at a, sing, at a signal came forward to stand before the dais. He wore a black velvet doublet and carried the Saxon harp on his back. As usual, Death followed at his heels. Robin felt as though the hall were as long as London Bridge, for when he entered all was quiet and his crutches seemed to make a great sound on the stone floor. Servants and courtiers bowed as he passed. What was going to happen? 
What had the king to say to him? Would his parents leave him and go back to London? At last, he reached the days, days. The king rose and stood over Robin, lifting from his own shoulders a chain of gold set with medallions of fine worksmanship. workmanship. Then he spoke, Can you kneel, my son? he asked. I can for a little time. He dropped to the cushion, supporting himself on one crutch. The friar took the other. Robin, son of Sir John de Buford, the king said solemnly, it has been told to us what service you have done for the lord of this castle and me, king of the whole realm of England and France. You are a true son of a noble father. Though but a youth, you have shown courage. A man might be proud to call his own. The king spread out the jeweled collar and dropped it onto Robin's shoulders, saying, This shall be a token of our high regard, and with it go our grateful thanks. Rise, young Robin, he commanded, and himself raised Robin to his feet. Robin was filled with gratitude to the king because now his father could be proud of him. He could not speak for a moment and indeed knew of nothing to say, but cheers and hand clapping began to make such a noise and a clatter that no speech could have been heard. When the noise had quieted a little, Robin was quieter too. He remembered the carol he had been learning for this very night, and words came to him. Sire, Robin began, I do thank you for this great honor, and I beg you to accept my song of Christmas. He brought forth the little harp he had grown to love, and he sang this carol. Come to Bethlehem and see him whose birth the angels sing. Come adore on bended knee, Christ the Lord, the newborn King. Glorious in excelsis Deo, glorious in excelsis Deo. When the song was ended, once more the hall rang and shouts and with shouts and cheers, Sir Robin, Sir Robin. Robin found himself standing between his mother and his father. Sir Robin, was it he? Sir, he added, he addressed his father. Mind you not that I must go thus bent over and with these crutches to help me walk? For he must know the worst at once. Gravely, Sir John answered, <clears throat> The courage you have shown, the craftsmanship proven by the harp, and the spirit in your singing all make so bright a light that I cannot see whether or no your legs have mishappened, misshapen, or misshapen. I cannot see that, is what he meant. As for me, said Lady Maud, slipping her arms about Robin, what a comfort it will be to know that wars will never claim you, and you can come home, for there is now no need for you to stay here at Lindsay, nor is there further need for me to be with the queen. She is now in good health. When the feast of Christmas is over, we shall all go home to London. Brother Luke shall come with us to be your tutor, if he will. When the midnight office was said in the church, the whole, whole, the whole household trooped back to the hall where tables were spread for the feast. Platters were heaped with food and carried in by pages and esquires. A giant boar's head came first in order, then pastries 
and whole suckling pigs, pigeons and geese roasted with feathers on. The meats were followed by flaming puddings and bowls of wassail, wassail, chestnuts and apples. Diath and the other hounds feasted too, for all the scraps were thrown into the rushes on the floor. It was nearly dawn when Robin felt himself lifted onto Brother Luke's back, for he had fallen asleep. Where am I? he asked in bewilderment. What has happened? Thou art here, Sir Robin, said the friar, safe with all thy loved ones. Tis the feast of Christmas, and thou hast found the door in thy wall. The end. Oh my gosh. I don't know about you. Come on. My, forgive my camera for trying to focus. I don't know about you, but I love this story. This is the final. This is con this concludes the final chapter, the tenth chapter of The Door in the Wall by Marguerite de Angeli. I pray that you have a wonderful whatever you're celebrating. It is nearly Thanksgiving and Christmas here, and I am praying it is 2020. So you know what's happening in the earth. In spite of all the darkness and all of the stuff that the devil has decided to dish out. I pray that you have an overwhelming joy, joyful and revelational, sweet uh, Thanksgiving and Christmas. And if it's not Thanksgiving and Christmas when you're reading this book, I pray that whatever you've put your hand to, that you prosper in Jesus. Until next time, thank you for listening, thank you for watching, and um, look out for your Selah moments. Selah, meaning pause, ponder, and praise the Lord, because I know, you don't even have to tell me, but I know he's been good to you, because he's been good to me. Until next time, shalom, shalom.